Uh, what I want to talk about tonight is love and marriage, and I call my talk Tokens of Affection, because as you will see um, during the course of the talk tonight, we are going to try to understand what the role of material was, what the role of stuff was, what the role of jewelry, especially tonight, but also other material goods, other material culture, were in love and in marriage. So what I would like to do is uh, introduce you first to the time and place I want to speak about, and then take you into the world of getting married in medieval Ashkenaz. But just for one moment before we do that, I think there's a history before the Middle Ages that needs to be noted. So we all know that today in many, many cultures, the Jewish culture included, uh, marriage is constituted often by the giving of a ring. And this is one of the things that in Jewish tradition we do under the chuppah. But if we go back to the period before the Middle Ages, we know that according to the Mishnah and then the Talmud, there were three different ways in which the Kiddushin, in which the betrothal, which was the first step, step I'm sorry, of the marriage process was actually um, enacted. And those three ways were by um, money, by a document, by a contract, and by uh, sexual relations, shtar, uh, pruta, and bia. Those were the three different ways that marriage could be constituted. And of course, over time, this evolved into some form of all of them, um, in that we have a ketubah, a document at the wedding. We have the pruta. One of the things that the rabbi always asks under a chuppah is, is this ring worth a pruta? And we also, of course, have the sexual consummation of a marriage. Uh, but if you look at these early sources which precede the Middle Ages, you can see that in these sources, we actually have no mention of a ring. Uh, one of the things they talk about in the Talmud when they discuss this is if a woman is willing to become um, betrothed by silken garments, for example, which were expensive and valuable garments, but we don't actually have a ring. So the ring comes into play only in the early medieval period, and in medieval Ashkenaz, as we will see, a ring was standard. So I'm saying this just at the very beginning to say that whatever I'm talking about tonight has a history preceding it, and material culture was always part of making this union of marriage. What I want to do tonight is talk about medieval Ashkenaz and ask what was the role of these different material goods in making a marriage, and as you will see as I go along, I'll constantly be, be asking, what is the place of love in all of this? Because today, when we think about marriage and we think about some of the material goods of a marriage, we actually think about the way they express love, a diamond ring, for example, some other piece of jewelry, or even the image used by Beta Vichai for our talk tonight, which was that famous bridge in Paris where we have all those locks that people put up on the bridge expressing their love and their commitment to each other. So what I'd like to do now is share the screen. For most of the talk, I will be following the PowerPoint. And when we need to look at the source sheet for the three different sources I want to look at with you tonight, I will direct you to these sources. Uh, one of the sources is very long. The other two are very short. And we'll get to the long source only towards the end of the talk. So I'm going to share my screen now. And Tamar, if there are any troubles seeing my screen, please let me know. And let us just start the PowerPoint. Just give me one second here. No, oh, no, one second. Is it okay now, Tamara? Can I can I go ahead? It's perfect. Yeah, you can continue. It's good. Okay, very good. So um, tonight, I want to talk about medieval Ashkenaz. Uh, many of us. Uh, know of Ashkenazic culture, whether through our own tradition or through that of others, the um, Jews of medieval Ashkenaz uh, that I will be talking about lived in uh, Northwestern Europe during the period from about 1100 to 1500. And at the very, very end tonight, I'll be talking about a little bit of a later period. And um, these Jews lived um, within the medieval cities that were growing urban centers at the time, they were invited to live in these places. Uh, they became uh, permanent residents of these cities, of these villages, of these towns, and they were very much part of the culture around them. Uh, and this is very, very important when we talk about marriage because one of the big changes that took place 
in medieval Europe, in medieval Christian Europe, is that marriage became a sacrament. And many of the different practices surrounding marriage um, were solidified and were codified and were ritualized by the church during this period. And I'll be talking about that a little bit later. So I'm going to talk about medieval Ashkenaz, the Jews of Northern France, of Germany, of England. Tonight we will see sources mainly from Germany, but I'll also show one or two sources from other places. As I said, this is a period of tremendous urban growth and the Jews are part of this urban reality. Um, the Jews are merchants, which means they handle goods all the time. And that's why material culture um, also comes into play in different ways when we talk about marriage. And I will be focusing, as I said, on material culture. What I wanna do is walk us through these different points just with a little bit more detail before I start talking about marriage itself. So here you can see one map of uh, medieval Ashkenaz. Uh, you can see the different places where we had Jews in England and in France, some of the larger communities. And if we look at this next map, we can see some of the places in what today we would call Germany or the Czech Republic or um, Austria. And these are the main countries or the main places we talk about in which we have Ashkenazic tradition developing. Of course, there were some differences between France and Germany of today. But in general, the, the custom used by the Jews in these places was a shared custom. And we know that many of the rituals of marriage were similar. We also know that Jews traveled from place to place in order to marry. So we have a lot of back and forth between these places. And if you look just at this map in front of you, you can see very nicely how they traveled. Travel was usually along the rivers. And you can see how the different places of settlement that are marked here on this map are places of settlement that, do, that are along these rivers. And we can understand how Jews went from place to place. Not only people went from place to place this way, but so did um, goods, so did um, merchandise. And the other point I made just now in my introductory remarks was to say something about urban growth. So I brought you just one example so you could have some idea of what this looks like. This is a map of the city of Troyes. Many of you have heard of this city. This is Rashi's city. This is where Rashi lived um, about 150 years after uh, this map that you see up before you here. You can see something very typical of these kinds of cities. You can see that the Jews are really in the center of town. You can see the river running around the city. And you can also see that the Jews live in the very, very center of town. If you can see my mouse now, you can see the old synagogue here in the middle. You can see that it's in between the castle over here, um, the Count's Palace over here, and the cathedral over here. So the Jews are really in the center of things. They're part of the everyday urban comings and goings. And um, this is where they sit and they thrive. Uh, one of the things that happens during this period is that all cities and all towns grow tremendously. And here you can see the city of Troyes about 300 years later than the first map I showed you. We still have the original center over here, but you can see how the town expanded. And with the expansion of the town, you can also see how the Jewish community moved and we now have a new synagogue over here where you see this yellow circle. And you can see that this is right near the goldsmiths, they're marked over here, and also right near the grain market. So you can see how the Jews stay very close both to the urban roots that are crossing through these cities and also how they are part of the growth of these cities. And this really is typical of almost every Northern European city we could choose during this period in which we can find the Jews in the center of town and part of the comings and goings of that city. So this was just to give you some idea of how we can understand this urban growth and the place of the Jews in these towns. Why am I emphasizing this so much? Because usually when we speak of the Jews of medieval Ashkenaz, we think of medieval rabbis. The medieval rabbis from Ashkenaz, who we often call the Rishonim, are those who, dot, who comment on our main um, books, whether it's the Pentateuch, whether it's other books in the Bible, or whether it's the Talmud. There are those who write many of the codes of law written during this period in Europe, in the Ashkenazi Minhag. And usually when we think of medieval Ashkenaz, we think of the rabbis. What I'm trying to emphasize here is how many Jews there were who weren't rabbis, who were merchants, who were traders, who were also, as many of you must know from the uh, stories told about medieval Jews, and I may say from some of the myths, they were also often money lenders. 
Um, what I would say is I'm not trying to say that Jews were not money lenders, but during these years of the high Middle Ages that I'm speaking about tonight, they most often were money lenders together with another profession, something that they traded in, something that they were known for and had an expertise in. Uh, we often know from records that if they lent money, they lent money to Christian merchants who did similar things to them. They weren't just there as money lenders, although there were some who were known as moneylenders. So I'm trying to say that there were many Jews who were part of this urban fabric and were not necessarily rabbis, or as we know from the stories about many of the medieval rabbis, some of them were rabbis who also had business and did business during this period. Uh, one more word about the period I'm talking about, uh, the medieval period. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about tonight is mainly from around probably um, 1100 or 1200, so the years after the First Crusade, and I'm going to end at around 1400 or 1450, during which period we also have um, some crises in which many of the Jews who live in medieval Ashkenaz move eastward towards northern Italy and from there also towards Poland, um, and that's how the Jews of Ashkenaz actually get to Poland after the Black Death in the mid-14th century. Uh, and um, in some of the places, Jews remain throughout the period, and some they're uh, expelled and then they come back. So we have Jews moving around quite a lot during this period. Now, these crises of the 14th century that I just mentioned, and I'm very happy and proud to talk about this now here at Beit Avichai, because last year when the pandemic started, uh, Tamar and I collaborated and we had a series on the 14th century and on the Black Death and the Jews, and any of you who want to can go back and watch those recordings. I'm sure they're on the website here, um, together with some of my students. Last year, when we talked about this, we talked about what happened during this period. Um, but another thing that we have thanks to this period is what you can see here in this picture before you. Um, this picture is a picture of the material culture found in Erfurt. Um, Erfurt is a city in Eastern Germany, and in 1349, the Jews of the city were expelled as part of the events surrounding the plague, um, surrounding the Black Death. And the person who left this treasure behind, we call it a treasure today, probably thought he was coming back. So he left his goods, his valuables hidden when he was forced to leave the city and never made it back. In this case, no one ever discovered these treasures until hundreds of years later. And that's why it's called the Erfurt treasure. Um, when this was discovered, people looked at it, they tried to understand what they had here, and they understood that this belonged to some Jew who had been forced to leave. We have treasures like this from all over uh, medieval Europe, uh, from Colmar, from, for example. I'll be showing you some things from Colmar as well. Some of you may have seen these um, treasures in different museums. The British Museum had a very big exhibit uh, displaying some of these things a number of years ago. And if we look carefully here, we can see that in these treasures we have some cups. Uh, we have something that looks like a besami box. Uh, but what really interests me is what you can see over here. You can see a ring over here. And you can also see some links that I'll tell you about a little bit later. These are part of a belt. So what we have in these treasures um, are also a lot of jewelry. You can see the jewelry here that I didn't circle that also is here. And this is part of the material culture that when we read about it in different written sources, we can understand what's going on around marriage. So from that point of view, these kinds of treasures are very, very important to understand the dynamics of marriage and what happened around the process of creating a match and making a marriage in medieval Europe. The last thing I wanna say before I continue is that um, one of the members of my research team at the Hebrew University, Dr. Ido Noy, wrote his dissertation on the wedding jewelry, basing himself, among other things, on um, the treasures found in the Air Force treasure. And much of what I'm going to be sharing with you tonight in different ways at different points of the talk, I've learned from him, via him, reading his work and pursuing other issues further. So I want to give him that credit as we start tonight. Um, and hope he's published some of this in English and in Hebrew, and hopefully he'll be publishing more of it. So if we want to talk about making marriages, if we want to talk about the jewelry, the material goods, the money, the cloths, anything that was used as part of deciding on a marriage that changed hands when making a marriage. I think the big question I want to ask tonight is, are we talking about love? Are these gifts of love? Or is this a business exchange? 
And in order to answer this question, we have to understand what it meant to make a marriage in medieval Ashkenaz. So uh, if we talk about making a marriage in medieval Ashkenaz, we're talking about a man and a woman whose families and they themselves decide on a marriage. I would say that the richer the family, the more well off the family was, the more likely that the two people getting married, the man and the woman, were less independent in making their choices. If you already can notice, what I'm not saying is that all medieval marriages were arranged, that young people had no say in who they were to marry, and I'm going to try to show you in a moment that this wasn't the case. But what I am trying to say is that this was a family matter. It wasn't just the decision of a man and a woman who fell in love with each other. And at times, or quite often, it was not just a family matter of who you were to marry, but also how this marriage would be finalized, how this marriage would be decided, and money changed hands. And that was part of what had to be decided. So if we look at just two comments made by different scholars, we should say, um, as Judith Tucker said in her book, marriage was a key to social harmony, a social necessity, as the desirable state of being for all members of the community without exception. And I would underline everything that Professor Tucker says here in this statement. So the first thing we have to understand is that the ideal for every Jewish man and woman in medieval Ashkenaz was to be married. And having people married and having people married happily and well was very important for the well-being of a community. And certainly a Jewish community that lived within a Christian surrounding in medieval Europe, where we had perhaps a few percentages of the people living in any given town or city being the Jews, maybe 2%, maybe 5%, not much more than that. So if there were 5,000 people in the town, we could have 50 Jews, sometimes we could have 100 Jews. In very, very big places, we could have 500 Jews or a few thousand, but we're not talking about large Jewish communities. Marriage, couples were the basis of every community. But the other point is that this strong premarital position did not mean that any and every marriage was acceptable. If a marriage were to reinforce social harmony, it was important to avoid the instability attendant upon mess alliance, which means that parents whose children were getting married were very, very involved in making these matches. They were very involved in deciding on who their children should marry. Now, when I talk like this, and if we think of movies like Fiddler on the Roof that we're all familiar with, we think of children who have little say in who they were to marry, in which the papa decided who this young person was supposed to um, be matched up with. And we can think of the matchmakers and all the other things we have in different stories. But actually what I want to say and what I want to underline is that if we think back to Fiddler on the Roof as some kind of example, the story of Fiddler on the Roof is how that traditional world fell apart. In Fiddler on the Roof, we see how Tevye's daughters, a story I'm, I assume that many of you listening to me tonight are familiar with, don't go according to what seems to be the rule. What I would actually argue is that this wasn't exactly the rule in medieval Ashkenaz either. In other words, this is an idealization of the past made by modern people going into a very modern world, if we think of the story of Fiddler on the Roof and the original by Shalom Aleichem. But to what extent was this actually the case in pre-modern Jewish culture? That's a question that we have to ask, and it's actually something I'm working on in my recent work and my recent research. Professor Avram Grossman, one of my teachers, um, who wrote a book about Jewish women in the Middle Ages, he says like this, during the 12th century and thereafter in Christian Europe, there was a firm widespread opinion in support of marriage requiring the full agreement of both parties. So I mentioned before that during the Middle Ages, marriage becomes a sacrament. And part of the church deciding that marriage is a sacrament is sanctifying the agreement between both members of the couple, the man and the woman. It's a conjugal decision. And saying that they have to both agree to the marriage in Christian Europe during the high Middle Ages, if a man and a woman committed themselves to each other, this meant they were married. They had to do so in present tense. I take this woman to be my wedded wife, not I will take and not I have taken. They had to say the right formula and they were committed to each other. 
Um, what Grossman says here is this, in fact, did not leave much of a mark on Jewish society. Only a small number of Jewish sages recognized the right of young sons and daughters to choose partners as they willed. The accepted norm in Jewish society in both Muslim countries and in Christian Europe was for the parents to choose the partner for their children. Professor Grossman says this, and this is the traditional opinion, the traditional stance. What I would argue is yes, parents were very involved in choosing the partner for their children, but we shouldn't take away the agency their children had. And we should ask, also ask how old were these children getting married? I would argue that they are above the legal majority age, so they were perhaps teenagers, but they were not minors, which meant that according to halakha as well, they had to agree to the marriage. So they had to agree to the marriage and to accept whatever match their parents proposed them. We'll see in a few moments how this plays out. So let us just see a few examples of matches of this sort being made before we come to the material culture. And I'm going to skip that first one and go on to here. So here we have a story from Sefer Hasidim, written in the late 12th or early 13th century in medieval Germany by Rabbi Judah Ben Samuel, often called Rabbi Yehuda HaChassid. And he tells the stories like this. One man coveted a young woman and he sent to speak with her and she did not desire him, nor did her relatives. He said to his father and his mother, if you do not toil so that this woman will be my wife, I will convert. So this is a very cute story, maybe a very scary story for the parents, um, in which this young man wants to marry a woman. She doesn't want to marry him, nor do her relatives. And he tries to convince his parents that they have to do something so that this marriage can take place. What does he do? He uses the typical medieval threat. He says, if you don't let me marry this woman, if you don't make her my wife, I will convert. His parents come up with a scheme. The scheme they come up with is that they'll take two witnesses and they'll pretend that actually they had been married and then this woman would be bound to him. I'm not going to go into that scheme tonight, but what I want you to notice here is that according to this story, both the woman herself and her family members, not necessarily her parents, but her relatives, were involved in making this match, and she has what to say here as well. Let us go on to my next example. One Jew sought after a woman, for he loved her and she loved him. He sent matchmakers to her father and to her mother, and they said, our daughter does not want this match. And she sent him a message secretly. I do want you, but my father and mother are engaged in a different match. Just wait, because he will not take me, and afterwards, they will busy themselves with me for you. Just occupy yourself primarily with how we can support ourselves. So this is another story in which we can see the man and the woman having a lot of agency, being quite independent. But we can also see what the formal procedure was. This man and woman love each other. But how does he find out if she can marry him? He sends matchmakers to her father and to her mother. They say our daughter doesn't want this match. So we can see a family that's not quite aligned with each other here. But she sends him a message secretly and says, I want you, but just wait. You have to wait till things run their course. And she knows that other man won't take me. And then they'll look into you and we'll be able to get married. And of course, we have, very importantly, the last word here, just occupy yourself primarily with how we can support ourselves. So here's another example in which we can see that there is love. So along with the business exchange of the families making the match and agreeing on the conditions of the marriage, which are mainly monetary conditions, and as we'll see in a moment, also mainly uh, conditions that have to do with property or with goods that the, usually the woman will bring into the marriage, but sometimes also the man, as time goes on more and more, the man and the woman, both of them. We can also see that there is love here. It's not just the business deal. Um, and here we can start seeing how this works. Um, I hope this is big enough on the screen in front of you. A person thought that Reuben's daughter would be given to him or to his son, and they agreed to give such a sum of money with her. So we can see that this kind of negotiation between parents involves money. What happens in the story, and all these stories that I'm telling you right now are from Sefer Hasidim, he does not perform the marriage ceremony because he wants money added to the conditions previously made or if Reuben promised a lot of money for his daughter and he was robbed or lost the money. 
and he, the groom, urges him to give him the money, he promised that he no longer has. So what do we have here? We have an agreement made between two fathers about their children being married, or between a man and another man about the marriage of a daughter, agreed with a sum of money, and then the marriage doesn't go ahead because they're waiting for the money. Either the father doesn't have the money anymore, or the groom or the groom's father wants more money. In any case, what we have here is years going by, and he waited for years. What Rabbi Judah the Hasid counsels here is not to wait for years, but to go ahead with the marriage, because delaying the marriage in this way is very problematic. But here we can see the business arrangement and what happens when that business arrangement doesn't go ahead. And um, what I want to do now that we've seen a few of these examples and I want to get to our material culture is just say one more word about what happens when people get married. So people would agree on a match. They would agree on the sums and on the gifts that would be given. And then they would wait whatever amount of time was agreed on and the marriage would take place. And if you look at your source sheet at source number one, we can see a description of this. And what I'm showing you here now is a map of the city of Cologne. You can see the Jewish quarter here. All um, of the pink houses you see here are Jewish houses and all of the green houses you see here are Christian houses. So you can see how close Jews and Christians live to each other. This blue square you can see over here is actually the city hall. So you can see how anyone who wanted to go to the city hall had to pass through the Jewish quarter to get there. Once again, you can see how central the Jewish community was within the city. And if you have a look over here, you can see where the synagogue was. And here we can see the synagogue itself. We can see the Tanz house, the place where the wedding festival would have taken place. We can see the mikveh, where the woman would have immersed before the wedding itself. And we can see where the ceremony we're about to read on about would have taken place. So let's look at source number one on our source sheet. So this is from 13th century Worms. And they talk about what happens. It is customary to leave the bride at dawn because this is good. And that is when Venus enters. So we can see why does the wedding ceremony start early in the morning? Because the star, because the planet Venus is then seen. And where do we learn this from? And what we're going to see here is that they constantly bring proofs from the book of Exodus to um, the receiving of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. So we're hearing here that a wedding is like standing at Sinai, the name of a dating site, as we know today. Um, that's because the tradition says that, um, that everyone was at Sinai. So if we believe that maybe matches were made before people were born, everybody stood at Sinai and everybody's match was made for them before they came into the world. But we can also see that medieval Jews um, use this idea and they equate between the wedding, wedding ceremony and standing at Sinai. So it came to pass on the third day when it was morning and there was thunders and lightning, that's from the book of Exodus. That is why they take torches. So now we have to imagine people walking with torches early in the morning. And when the bride comes into the gate of the house, the groom goes towards her and takes her hand and puts it on the door frame. In this source, it's not exactly clear where this is happening. Is it happening in the synagogue or is it happening in the bride's house? But we can see how they go in together and the groom takes the bride's hand. They make a blessing and they put a shawl on their head. I purposely didn't write talit because it says tsaif. It's not clear that it's talit, although later in the source they talk about a talit. Today we know that brides and grooms put the talit on their head. And we learned this from the book of Exodus as well. And then they stand the bride to the right of the groom, and there's a reason for that. And after the blessing, after they make the brachot, after they make the blessings of the betrothal, it is customary to eat honey and cheese. So this is a description from the 13th century. Um, I want us to look at this um, picture over here. This is a picture of the synagogue from Mainz, what's left from the synagogue, I'm sorry, from Speyer, what's left from the synagogue in Speyer, so we can almost imagine where they would have stood inside or outside, probably in the yard outside of this synagogue wall. And if we look at this map over here, a map of the Jewish community of Worms, we can imagine how they would walk along the river, they would come back into the community, go to the synagogue and kind of walk through the quarter and everyone in the community would see this bride and groom getting married. If they were beautifully dressed, they would see how beautifully dressed they were. If we look at source number two, we can see another description of this wedding and we can hear what happened and we can get a little bit more detail. And one of the things we can see is how over time, 
uh, the rules of procession, the rules of the procedures and the customs of marriage become much more specific in the sources. And you'll see that even just in the three sources I've brought for you tonight. So in Mainz, they make the blessing right after the prayer services in the morning. And all of the brides and grooms relatives wear Sabbath clothes. And Rabbi Jacob Segal, who made the blessing, he was Maharil, the person who this book of customs that I'm quoting from, from the early 15th century is from. Maharil's student wrote these um, instructions down, would also wear Sabbath clothes in their honor. And they bring the bride with musical instruments until the entrance to the synagogue. And then the rabbi and other important members of the community go and take her by her clothes and stand her to the right of the groom. And the mothers of the groom and the bride go and stand by her in the tower during the blessing. So we can see how this wedding procedure is witnessed by many people and so many people are involved in it. I'll come back to our lack source later, but let us try to understand what actually happened here. In order to do that, I want to tell you a little story. And I want to tell you a story of how they got to this stage of being married, um, but it actually leading up to the marriage. This is from a responsa written um, in uh, the 13th century by Rabbi Isaac um, ben Moses of Vienna. And he's actually reporting a question that he received that came from Hungary. So this is really interesting because it shows us that people are sending questions to rabbis from all over Europe. And the story reported in this response, I didn't bring you the text because it's very, very long, tells of two men who decide that their children would be married. And after they decide their children would be married, the groom and his mother send gifts to, a young, to the young woman. And they send a ring, the groom sends a ring, and his mother sends a belt. And they send these gifts with a messenger, hoping that this woman will accept these gifts and this will begin the process of bringing this young man and woman together. In this case, they're trying to do something that's a little bit complicated, which is having the kiddushin, having the betrothal done by a messenger. So the messenger, Shimon, Simon, in this story, you can see the quote here, comes to the house where the young bride is waiting. He takes out the ring and says to her, here is the ring that the man sent to you to betroth you. And she did not respond because she covered her face and she did not or could not look at them. And then another woman took the ring from, from Shimon. This other woman had also taken the belt from Shimon. So we have a very complicated story here in which the groom's family is sending the bride a ring and a belt and she is refusing to take them. Um, by refusing to take them, she's also saying, I don't want this marriage. And I'm bringing this here just to emphasize the fact that young people did have a choice. And even if their parents decided what would happen, they could refuse the marriages. But from here, from this example, I want to go to the material culture and talk a little bit about the tokens of affection that were used in medieval Europe. So if we have a look over here, we can see two things, a ring and a belt. If you look at this picture here from medieval Haggadah, created in the 15th century in the city of Nuremberg, you can see an illustration of the wedding of Moses and Tipora. This is from a Haggadah. So it's illustrating the scenes that have to do with Yitziat Mitzrayim, with leaving Egypt, and with the story of Exodus celebrated on Passover. And you can see here um, that Moses in this picture is handing Tipora a ring. So what I would like us to do now is look at Tipora and see all the tokens of affection that we can see on her. And I'm going to talk about a ring, I'm going to talk about a belt that we just saw in that story before, and also expand on one other, on two other items you can see here. So if we have a look here, we can see that he is putting a ring on her finger. And I gave you a reference here to Idonoi's PhD because he has written extensively on these rings. What were these rings? One idea was that these rings were these rings that were found in the different treasures. And if you remember before, I circled that ring when I showed you a picture of the treasure. This is a very special ring. It's called a Mazal Tov ring. From Erfurt, we have one that looks like a building. You can also see that the one from Colmar looks like a building, as does the one from Weissenfels. If you look carefully here, you can see Hebrew letters on the top and it says Mazal, and on the other side it says Tov. Also here it says Mazal Tov on the top, you can't see it here. 
And also here it says Tov, you can see it here on the side of this ring. And if you look at the bottom of the ring here, you can see that it looks like two people clasping hands, a classic sign of marriage. In fact, in Christian Europe at the time, getting married was often called to clasp hands. So you can see this over here. So this is one option for the ring that Moses might be giving Tzipora. However, Ido has, Dr. Noy, has argued in his work that this was probably a ring that was used to put the ketubah in. The ketubah was held within a ring like this. It was kind of like a napkin ring is today or some kind of clasp for the ketubah, for the document itself. It was transferred from one to another. This is a very beautiful and very expensive ring. Probably every community had a ring like this that was used by every person getting married. This was not a personal ring. So when we see Moses giving Tzipora a ring, we're probably talking more about a ring like this. What you can see here is a ring found in one of the treasures. You can also see an illumination of a ketubah from Krems from the 14th century in which you can see the bride holding a ring in her hand. This ring looks very much like this ring over here. And what I put over here was an illustration of a German Christian used wedding ring at the time in which you can see all kinds of little animals. These rings often also had um, words on them like I love you or love lasts forever or all kinds of saying of this sort. So even if we're talking about a business deal made by two fathers or two parents who decided to marry their children, we can see that these kinds of rings, whether they say mazalto, which is what was being wished for the couple, or even more a ring like this, which is used by Christians that said in German of the time, something about love, told us something about what was hoped for, what was expected from these rings. And we know that these rings remained with the bride, so they weren't communal rings like the ones we just saw a moment ago, which were big rings and very, very expensive. These rings were rings that would have been very impractical to wear on a daily basis. Rather, they were rings that looked like this that were much more practical to wear. And we hear about them in a number of different sources. I just brought two examples. It was the custom to always perform kiddushin with a ring. Even just saying that tells you that there were other options like we have in the Mishnah and the ring would remain in her hand as a memoir. So she would keep that ring forever. And again, from Rabbi Jacob Mullen, who we read a moment ago, describing the wedding ritual, we can see, since we are used to performing Kiddushim with the ring, it makes sense that the betrothed, the Mikudeshet, I'm sorry for the typo here, keeps it for many days and it does not decay. For women guard their Kiddushim rings for many days out of fondness. So we can see that it becomes a symbol of marriage, something women are very fond of, and they keep these rings for a very long time. If we go back to Tzipora for a minute and we look at her, we can see another item here. We can see a crown on her head. And in these same treasures, crowns like this were found. Um, here you can see the parts of a crown that were found in one of the treasures. Here you can see another crown that was found in a different, found in a different treasure. And if we look at medieval illuminations, medieval Jewish illuminations, we often will see the bride with a crown on her head. Once again, this was probably a crown that belonged to a family or belonged to a community. It was used for every bride. It wasn't something she actually kept um, or not necessarily kept. In some cases, maybe yes, but probably most often no. So, so far we've seen the ring that was given to the woman to be kept, but we also see how the community uses material goods to consecrate the marriage and to symbolize how important it is. Going back to Tzipora again, you can see, and this is a little bit hard to see here, that she has a belt around her waist. These belts were probably a gift of marriage given by the groom to the bride, just like we saw a moment ago with that bride who refused to take the belt. And we also can see here that there is a pin that she's wearing. Um, this again was one of the gifts that women also re often received as part of a marriage. The pins probably looked something like this. Um, and if you have a look at this pin, you can see that there are some uh, German letters over here. These are um, words that had different sayings, can be found on different pen pins uh, about uh, love and about what was expected. Um, and we also can see that um, in this case, it says, Oem means, I'm sorry, Oem means Herze. Um, this, she's, he's giving her, my, her his heart. 
Um, and if you look over here on, I'm sorry. If you look at this slide, you can also see uh, the belt in the Air Force treasure before I noted that there were pieces of a belt that were found. These were very, very long belts. Um, and they often also had uh, different sayings about love, not in Hebrew, but these were bought from Christian neighbors. Christians probably wore very similar belts. Here you can see two different sayings. One that says um, that love conquers all and uh, we should uh, succeed, we should surrender to love um, or other sayings of this sort. I wrote them down over here. And this belt um, and these pins were often given to brides as something to remember during marriage. Now, one of the, something for them to have during marriage, they were the gifts of marriage. They were part of the conditions agreed upon by the families when making a wedding. And we can understand why, because they're very expensive items. But if we try to think about what these mean, are these gifts of affection? They say love, they have sayings about love on them. But um, scholars have also written that these are ways to guard this woman to say, she belongs to him. It's not just a matter of affection, it's a matter of possession. Uh, the pins near the neck were often seen as kind of chastity pins to cover her up, to close her dress, to hide her body. And the belt around her waist was a sign of chastity to say, this woman belongs only to this man and she has to keep herself only for this man. So even these gifts that are filled with sayings about love, even these gifts are gifts that say something about the possessiveness of marriage, about a woman belonging to a man in a very specific way, not necessarily one that is very romantic. And if we wanna see another belt, we have to understand these belts were very, very long. Here you can see the different pieces that were found in Erfurt in the treasure and the way that modern scholars try to reconstruct them in order to understand them. So if we try to understand the different gifts, the different material goods given as part of marriage, they were usually part of the financial agreements. And even if they expressed some sort of romantic thought, they also expressed ideas of that this woman should belong only to this man of possessiveness, of patriarchy. And if we look again at Tipora, who we saw before, we can note the crown, the pin, the belt, and her finger waiting for the ring here. These are all could be seen as tokens of affection, but what I've tried to tell you tonight is that they are not necessarily only tokens of affection. But at the same time, I want to bring us back to these sources that I showed you before, so that we can remember that many women were very fond of these pieces of jewelry. They would remain on their hands. They would be used to dress up at celebrations with fondness. So we can't really um, say that they were only marks of possession or of business exchange or of uh, marital agreements. They also had sentimental value to these women and to these couples. So what I want to do now is look at the last source and to show you another picture of a wedding. So we have these bride and groom in mind. We can see the bride covered here and the groom standing next to her. This is the groom and this is the bride. We can see them under the talit. So we can see that this is part of how they got married. And if you look at the last source on the source sheet, this is a very long source and we probably won't have time to read all of it, but it's a source from the 17th century that describes the marriage ceremony in great detail. Now, one of the things that's very nice about this source is that it expresses something that I've actually been talking about tonight without specifying it um, as such. And that is that the marriage process went on for quite a while. A couple could be engaged, the marriage could be agreed upon, gifts could be exchanged, assuming the bride didn't reject them. And then it might take a while until that couple actually stood under the chuppah and the wedding ritual was performed. Sometimes in medieval Ashkenaz, first they performed the Kiddushin, and then a while later the Nisuin. Often the two um, parts of the ceremony were united as they are today in Jewish marriages. But this book from the 17th century, written by Yuspa, who was the Shamish of Worms, he was the beetle. He was one of the members of the community who helped the ritual run properly, and he wrote down the communal ritual, tells us how these agreements were made and what happened at every stage of the way. Marriage was not just the wedding, it was the Shabbat before and the Shabbat after, and it was all kinds of ceremonies in the house and at the synagogue. So let's just have a little bit of a look at this and see what's happening. So generally, they arrange the betrothal. I'm at the source sheet, at source number three, it starts about four lines before the bottom of the first page. 
at the home of the rabbi, and immediately after the vessel is broken for the betrothal agreement, the people who are present go to the home of the groom and say to him, Mazal Tov. And if they wish, they go to the home of the bride as well to say to her, Mazal Tov. Now, this is really interesting because this is taking place in a home. The match is being made in a home where neither the groom or the bride are. Only their parents and their families are there. And the mother of the bride brings along female neighbors and relatives to the home of the groom. And they say to the groom, Mazal Tov. And the custom is for the father of the groom and the bride to distribute lip cushion, so this is a kind of cake, after the betrothal. And on the day of the betrothal, the groom makes a meal. And here we have the name of the meal in Yiddish, the knas meal. So this happens before the marriage ceremony, when the agreement is made that this couple should be married. And then they go on. For seven days before the marriage ceremony, the bride wears white garments, and they summon the young woman to dine with her, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have all these different things happening. And um, they, they go from house to house, and we have um, the friends of the bride and the groom going with them. I'm going to skip a little bit so that we can um, see what happens. Uh, but we have here on the Shabbat before the wedding, we have them sitting in the home. And if you skip to page three, uh, you can just see at the very top when they go to the home of the bride, the bride also sits at the head of the table, adorned with lovely clothing as befitting her status. And they describe the different kinds of garments she wears. And we can see that she even is wearing a kind of uh, crown on her head. That's the chapel. And you can see it next to source number six, footnote number 16. You can see that she's wearing a crown on her head. And the table is decorated and bedecked like the table of the groom. And around the table sit young women adorned with lovely clothing. And they sit there with great modesty and they do not eat or drink. And the men and the women who come there stand at the table and observe the table and its vessels and the bride. Here we have another example of material culture given at the wedding. We have the vessels that were given to them. And um, what happens after this is that we have a whole process, a whole procedure of gift giving. So this material culture becomes very, very important as part of the procedure of weddings. So we can see how it becomes really formalized and made into a ritual. And in many ways, we can see how these different jewelry, vessels, cloths, clothing, all of these things that are worn by the bride and groom become part of a show that is put on for the community. Do, is there affection? Are they tokens of affection? Perhaps. But they're also symbols of the marriage arrangement made, of the agreements between the families, of social status, of wealth, of setting up this couple for life. I think that we've gone a long distance from these days in medieval times to today, when a lot of times we talk about different tokens of affection. But at the same time, many of the different gifts we give today are also part of formalities, of customs, of conventions, of love. And one can wonder how much personal um, attachment there is to these different garments or uh, jewelry, and we know there's quite a bit of that. We can also wonder how much of a convention it is and what it means. So we can see similarities and also differences to the medieval period. I'm going to end here and I'm happy to answer any questions there are. I hope that um, you've enjoyed seeing the material remains from the medieval period and also going into this mentality of marriage that is somewhat different from today. I will stop the share screen so that you can see me and Tamar, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Elisheva, first of all. Um, I think we all find it interesting and also sometimes maybe even troubling learning the history of some of these um, parts of the ceremonies which we take for granted. Um, I'm going to give a second for people to see if um, people type. Um, we have one comment here who's actually saying thank you for helping us understand um, some of the rituals among the Christians. I'm sure things are probably similar in the Christian world and also in the Jewish world. Um, I actually have a question for you, as since you talk about the where the ring comes or what are the backgrounds, as modern Jewish women, would you have a suggestion to change something in the ceremony, knowing the background of these rituals? Uh, I think that uh, there's a change that is happening more and more, um, but maybe we could go a step further, uh, which is that we see the bride and the groom exchanging rings at many ceremonies today. So at least in that way, we're uh, really making it a, 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 
uh, a commitment from both sides, right? So it's a commitment of the man to the woman and the woman to the man. I did not talk about this today, but I think it's a well-known thing that in uh, that medieval, that traditional Jewish marriage is really uh, giving a woman to a man, um, and it's a, a process of, uh, of of acquiring a woman. And there is a lot of um, connotations, and not just connotations that are like a, a business deal of some sort or the buying of a wife, right? Um, and I think that the ring is a symbol of that. That's the way ishani knet we say in Hebrew: a woman is bought. So. As 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 uh, gentle as we try to as as gentle a way as we may choose to try to translate translate that that certainly is part of a patriarchal society that many of us might not identify with today. I think that by exchanging rings mutually, uh, we can actually uh, make that something much more mutual, two sided. And uh, today, in many Orthodox rituals, at least in many non Orthodox rituals, this is done completely freely and completely mutually. In many Orthodox rituals, we have many women giving men rings, but some rabbis won't let it be part of the actual wedding ceremony. Um, and it's not as oblig obligating. You don't need witnesses for it. Perhaps it's something we can change. I think the other thing we can do um, is having a woman also sign the ketubah. So it could be a mutual agreement between the man and the woman, and we'll really give her a voice in that agreement. Oh, okay. Um, we have some questions coming up. What were the rings made out of in the Middle Ages? Okay, so as you saw in the pictures I show you, we have very beautiful uh -huh. rings. Many of them are made out of gold. Um, and uh, we know that there was a lot of use of gold and silver and enamel and precious stones. Um, and the Jews often dealt in these as part of their business. I'm not trying to say that all Jews were rich merchants, but there were Jews who were rich merchants who dealt in precious stones. Uh, we even have stories about Jews who sold precious stones to churches. Uh, if we think of medieval Christian art, one of the things we'll see in any medieval Christian in any medieval church is we'll see reliquaries in which they have different relics and they make beautiful cases for them filled with uh, jewels. So we have jewels all over the place and rings um, that Jews used are no exception to that. You saw that in the picture I showed you of the treasure from Erfurt. Okay. Um, how do Siblanut belts fit in with your presentation? I hope I pronounced it correctly. Siblanut. 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 Yeah. Um, so sivlanot are really the um, the presents that were given were called sivlanot, right? That was part of the, the the different objects used as part of the agreement. And a belt was a very standard one. So almost every Jewish marriage would have a belt given from the man to the woman. What I tried to suggest to you is this also had a lot of symbolic, it, it carried this symbolism of chastity, of belonging. So it's not just giving her a belt because it's a beautiful garment and something that will make any dress beautiful, but also a way of saying you are mine and you are bound to me. Um, and that makes a lot of sense because if we have agreement, a matchmaking agreement between the couple um, or between the couple's families, this is a way of saying you are bound to each other and what's better than a belt to bind someone to someone else. Okay, Lorraine wants to know if there was ever divorce in these days. Okay, so um, that, that actually is a great question when we're talking about Jews and Christians. Um, in the Christian church during the medieval period, divorce was banned. Marriages could be annulled, under specific circumstances. Divorce was so rare. It was usually only in cases of extreme cruelty. Um, as one of my teachers used to say, if a man was so cruel to his wife and beat her all the time, she could be divorced, but she probably would have been dead before she was allowed to be divorced, right? Because she would have been beat so cruelly. So cruelty was grounds for divorce, but there were very few grounds for divorce. Divorce was banned by the Christian church, by the Catholic church, that is the Christian church during this period. One of the really interesting things is that Jews, divorce throughout the period. The Jews divorced from uh, ancient times, from the Bible until today. Um, some scholars have claimed that there was a lot of divorce among medieval Jews. Some claimed there was less divorce. Um, the most kind of largest numbers are that one third of the couples got divorced. I'm not sure if I would go quite that far. That sounds almost modern, but we certainly have a lot of divorce. And it's in the divorce uh, discussions that we often have reference to the material goods because the woman will say I got married and I brought in with me so and such, such and such money and I had this necklace and I had this jewelry and I got these silk garments for my family and I want their worth now when we're getting divorced they're mine so she's refusing to give up that money so actually divorce often helps us understand how marriage was made and I think it's very much like the Talmud you can't understand how someone gets married if you don't understand how you take the marriage apart so we have to think about all of these things as well. So these tokens of affection can afterwards become tokens or not actually tokens, actually possessions or objects 
that you argue about when the divorce is taking place and Jews are getting divorced throughout the period. 